Hello, welcome to my festive tech calendar session for 2023. Uh, my session is an introduction to Azure Terraform. So firstly, just a hello from myself. My name is Jake Walsh. Uh, I'm a senior solution architect working for CDW UK. I'm fairly active uh, over on, on social channels. So I, I'm on X at uh, Jake Walsh 90, tweet occasionally, post blog articles, that sort of thing. Um, I'm also um, at jakewalsh.co.uk, which is my blog. So I tend to uh, write articles, post code, that sort of thing uh, there as well. Um, just the usual disclaimer. Um, so views, opinions in this presentation on my own, please do check the latest documentation. It is important, obviously, if you're watching this perhaps a little bit later on or something like that, then um, yeah, just making sure you've got the most, uh, most up-to-date information. Um, also, just want to point out that the Festive Tech Calendar YouTube channel is well worth a visit. There's loads and loads of great content and just like to say a huge thank you to um, to the team that's organised this. Um, if you'd like to see more of the presentations, more of the content, then please scan the uh, scan the code. Also this year, the Festive Tech Calendar is raising money for the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, great cause if you can spare um, you know, a pound or two or whatever, then everything really would be would be appreciated. OK, so let's talk about the session goals for today. So I'm going to cover off um, a number of things um, and I'll finish with a, with a demo and some additional resources. So um, today we're going to cover the following. So we're going to look at what infrastructure as code um, actually is and, and why you would use it. I think that's that's really important because it sets the scene um, and you know we need to set that before we move on to talk about Terraform. Um, we'll then actually look at what Azure Terraform actually is. So you know what is, what is Azure Terraform? You know what what is Terraform when we take a look at it? So we'll cover off a little bit of the context and background around that. Um, we'll talk about how Terraform works. Um, I'm going to cover that at a basic level just for getting started and also going to talk about why it's relevant. So understanding you know why would we actually use terraform you know what are the benefits what are the things we need to consider when doing so um we'll look at getting started so what do you need to get started with terraform we'll talk about installation we'll talk about some of the tooling all of the things that can help you on that that journey as well and then we'll talk about um and, and show some code samples so i want to go through those samples just to break it down a little bit and then we'll go into a bit of a demo and talk about next steps and, uh, and provide some resources so let's let's start by setting the scene. So what actually is infrastructure as code? So it's a method of managing and provisioning infrastructure resources via code. In most cases, it's imperative. So that's, for example, do something or declarative, build something. Um, it's often integrated into version control systems. Think, you know, GitHub, Azure DevOps, those types of technologies. And it's usually edited and managed um, in most common tools and platforms. So things like GitHub, Visual Studio Code, Azure DevOps. You know, other tools are available, but these are the sort of ones I work with on a on a day to day basis. Um, Infrastructure as code is usually adopted as part of a, a wider DevOps strategy, not always. Um, there are lots of use cases, for example, just building out simple lab environments or you know, doing some testing perhaps that don't fit into that strategy and are, are used in isolation. But certainly in most enterprises, most organizations, it's part of a wider strategy as well. Um, it actually enables a move away from click ops. So for example, you know, repeatedly doing things in the portal or perhaps um, you know, working through things manually and brings perhaps more, I would argue, more streamlined approaches to, uh, to building out your infrastructure, changing it or destroying it. So when we talk about imperative code, we're, we're defining a task to be carried out. So here's, here's an Azure CLI example for creating a VM. Um, in this example, if you repeatedly did this, it would error because it would say, well, I can't create that virtual machine because it already exists. So that's a, just a, a very basic example of, of an imperative um, piece of code. When we talk about declarative, and here's an example creating some resource groups in Terraform, we're actually defining components to be created. We're not asking for a task to be carried out. We are describing the infrastructure. And in this example, if we applied this once and then applied it again, we'd actually just get a message from Terraform telling us that no changes are required. Um, in this case, it would be because the resource groups are already um, built but if we were using the previous example of a virtual machine it would say the vm is already built so it wouldn't try and repeat the same task because it would know that had already been created and that there was no additional work to carry out so why why would we actually use infrastructure as code what's the you know what's the real the real benefit to doing this for, for me that there are numerous benefits and you know this is something that actually could be the the subject of its own discussion really but i think it boils down to three things one is is cost so we can deploy much more rapidly, we can be quicker, we can test those changes, we can spin up test environments, copies of, of production environments, that sort of thing. It also brings with it increased speed. 
so we can deploy faster. There's less manual intervention, no clicking through portals or doing tasks manually. And that means things are easier to test. Uh, it's also opening us and exposing us to less risk of human error, for example. It also allows us to um, adopt and it enables those DevOps methods and practices. So, you know, think, for example, of um, actually we would like to deploy an application. If we do it manually, it's two days worth of manual work. Well, if we spend two days developing and writing the code, we can deploy it quickly multiple times. That's the sort of um, process that it enables us to do. And with um, with that speed um, obviously becomes reduced risk so reduced through the ability to test quickly reduced through the fact that our deployments are more consistent they always are done from a standard template for example it also means we can adopt technologies like version control where we can put our back-end code for an application or our blocks of code that define infrastructure in a version control system and we can have easy you know change management of that um, on top of the process as well I've talked before about the infrastructure as code um, usage being viewed as a benefit cycle. As you do um, infrastructure as code and as you adopt it, you'll tend to find that many of the benefits will sort of, you know, be become increased in nature. They will get bigger. The cycle continues. You know, take this as an example. You'll find that because things are more repeatable, your speed of deployment increases. Because of that repeatability and your more rapid speed, it enables better testing. Your risk is minimized. Because you deploy repeatably from the same template, your consistency increases. Because you're using a standardized template that's more reliable than clicking and doing tasks manually, then reliability also increases. We also find that we can write once, deploy many times, and that duplication, again, minimizes our risk, increases our consistency, increases our speed of deployment. So all of these benefits are sort of cyclical in nature, and you'll find that one sort of snowballs and, and translates into another. You'll find that you get faster, you'll find that you get more consistent uh, by adopting these infrastructure as code methods and practices. And just worth noting, I'm talking about Terraform today. Um, other platforms are available. You know, this is just a screenshot from a Wikipedia page that shows, you know, there's tooling like Chef, Otter, Puppet, um, lots of different tools that are available. I really like Terraform because I find it easy to easy to read, but it is worth just checking out other other tools and platforms, um, you know, to see what fits your your uses and, uh, and needs. So let's talk about what Terraform is. So Terraform is an infrastructure as code software tool that can interact with a wide range of platforms and environments. And it does that using something called a provider. I'll come on to the Azure provider specifically um, a little bit later on in this session. But provider is essentially um, a method that allows Terraform to talk to a target API. So that target API could be Azure, it could be AWS, for example. Um, Terraform can be used both in the cloud and on premises. Um, it can be used to actually combine those. You might have a deployment, for example, that talks to an on premises environment, it talks to one or more cloud environments as well. So you can actually use it to do deployments across multiple different platforms um, and, and areas that you may wish to deploy into. Um, it comes in three main varieties. So I'm actually going to use the community edition today. Um, Again, well worth checking that out, um, and we'll go through the installation of that shortly. Um, but that's just the version I'll be using for my demos today. There's also Terraform Cloud, again, an amazing product, something I would absolutely recommend checking out once you've sort of got comfortable with Terraform and, and learnt the basics. Um, there's also an enterprise offering, which provides more enhanced levels of support and the sort of enterprise needs for a larger um, organization as well. So again, I've talked about those three main varieties. I'm using the community edition today. There's also Terraform Cloud, which again provides you with managed Terraform. And there's also the enterprise, which provides those self-managed custom deployments. Do take a look at terraform.io if you'd like to learn more about those different variations. But again, I'll be using the community edition to, to do my demo today. Um, again, just a, a note on pricing. So obviously um, I'm using community edition, so there's no cost attached to that, but the, the cloud and enterprise offerings do have different tiers and levels that you may wish to look into. Um, worth noting, and if you're interested, have a look at my blog. There's a getting started guide for Terraform Cloud, but it's actually free for up to 500 resources a month. Um, so it's well worth looking at if you just want a way to deploy perhaps a, a smaller environment or something that's less than those 500 resources um, that, that it provides for free. So one thing we do need to cover as well before we start looking at different options and, and different elements within Terraform is authentication. Um, this is really important because when we're working in demo and lab environments, for example, we'll probably just authenticate the CLI or perhaps use a, a service principle. 
Um, when we're talking about production environments, actually service principles or managed service identities are probably going to be what we would use. So I've pasted a link there, um, well worth a look at that just to understand. For today's demo, I will use um, just authentication at the CLI, keep, keep things nice and simple. And that's probably what I would recommend you use to start with. Um, it's not going to sort of, you know, open you to any risk as an example, you know, leaving a service principle in code or something like that. It means we can do that interactively just in, in VS Code and keep things nice and simple for our for our demo today. Worth also noting that in the registry um, for the Azure RM Terraform provider, there's a whole guide on authentication, covers the different methods, covers how you would set those up. So I'd recommend absolutely check that out if you're looking at perhaps moving beyond just authentication at the at the CLI. So a little earlier, I talked about providers uh, and I talked about essentially that, that we would need to add a provider to our code um, before we can start interacting with, with Azure. So providers are essentially plugins for Terraform that allow Terraform to interact with an external API. There's a whole range of providers that are available and I'll cover an overview of that in a second, but in simple terms, they enable communication with platforms or services outside of Terraform. So for Microsoft Azure, for example, we would need to add the Azure RM provider to Terraform before we can interact with Azure. And I will go through that in my demo. That provider therefore means that Terraform has a method of interacting with Azure. It adds that functionality and that layer of features so that we can create different resources. We can create resource groups, virtual machines, and those providers actually define how that we would do that process. So for example, it will give us an overview of this is what you need to do. This is the code you would need to write to create a resource group, for example. Um, one thing I would absolutely recommend once you are just learning, getting started with Terraform, take some time to go through that provider. Um, so have a look at registry.terraform.io do a search for Azure, you'll find the Azure RM provider or just visit this link here. It's worth just going through that, gaining an understanding of the conventions, the ways of writing that. And what I really like about the Azure RM provider and all of the providers that um, that are maintained in the, in the HashiCorp guide is they have workable examples. So you can look at those, understand what's being created and actually paste that in and try out the sample for yourself. So that makes learning very, very easy and very straightforward. Just a quick screenshot of the Azure uh, RM provider. So this is the Azure provider we would need if we were going to be uh, creating resources in Azure. But what you can see is on the left, um, I'll just highlight that now, within this, there's actually a documentation section. So we can search for the type of resource we need to create, and that will then be displayed in this area here. So for example, if you wanted to create a virtual machine, you would just type virtual machine in here, and it would show all of the options for creating virtual machines really handy, really useful. What Again, what I really like about that is all of the examples are fully workable. So just taking that virtual machine example, if you looked at a, let's say a Windows virtual machine, it would show you the creation of not only the virtual machine, but also the resource group, perhaps the disk, perhaps a network card, all of the things that would be needed to support that resource if you were using it um, in production, or you actually wanted to go ahead and create it. So again, as I said, other providers are available. You can see here just a snapshot. Um, these are perhaps some of the more common ones, but you can see there's a huge range of different providers, lots to, to go at. Um, one of the other providers I use fairly regularly and I'm actually going to use in my demo today is a provider called the Random Provider. And that does exactly what it says. It allows us to generate randomizations within our code. So think passwords, security keys, perhaps shared secrets, VPNs, for example. Again, just another screenshot here. So this is actually the AWS provider. Again, you can see guidance here. They're all uh, standardized in, in, in this way. So if you need to find a resource, you can search. If you need to use the provider, it shows you the code block that you need to add and actually just helps you build out what you need to, uh, to start using those providers as well. So let's just talk and have a think about process now. So how does Terraform actually work? So Terraform, as we've discussed, is files of code that define our infrastructure. And those are typically known as, as TF files, um, again, because they have the extension .tf. So those files sit in a folder. And when we run Terraform, those files actually define the infrastructure and its configuration or, or changes that we, we actually want Terraform to apply. At the time of running Terraform, those files are then analyzed and built into an execution plan to apply our changes. So Think of it as a folder full of perhaps one or more files that define our infrastructure. Those are analyzed, put into an execution plan that contains things like dependencies. Think, for example, this resource group needs to be created before we build a VM. That's analyzed and built by Terraform, and then we have the option to apply our changes. 
So in terms of stages as well, when you actually run Terraform, there are a number of stages of deployment. So we need to initialize Terraform first and foremost. And again, I will go through these in my in my demo later. But initializing Terraform actually initializes those binaries and downloads any providers that we have defined. So in the case of Azure, it would download the Azure RM provider. Perhaps in my demo, you'll see the random provider as well. We then have the option to run a plan. So plan doesn't apply any of the changes. All it does is looks at our Terraform files and builds an execution plan and tells us what Terraform would be carrying out if we asked it to, to go ahead and apply. There's then two main commands that we will need to run for my demo. There are other commands available, but this is what I'm focusing on just for the introduction session here. Um, apply is fairly self-explanatory. That actually carries out the um, execution plan and carries out the changes that we've asked Terraform um, to do within our code. It's worth noting that if you run apply and then make no changes to the code and rerun apply, it will go off and simply say there are no changes. It would be the same if you ran plan, for example. Um, Terraform destroy. Again, fairly self-explanatory there. It actually destroys the infrastructure. So you can start getting to this point where you can actually build and destroy infrastructure very quickly just with a few simple command line um, options using Terraform. So we can't talk about Terraform without talking about the state file. So this is a really important concept when using Terraform. So Terraform actually needs to store information about your infrastructure within a file known as the state file. And that state file allows Terraform to maintain a, a working knowledge or a history, if you like, of what's actually been built and therefore use that to build out changes to, to its execution plan. So think, for example, that you ask Terraform to go off and build three virtual machines. It would build those virtual machines and write those to the state file. It knows it's built three virtual machines. If you then go back to your code and delete one of those, it would compare your code to the state file and actually say, well, there's three VMs that have been built and I need to remove one now. That's how that execution plan is, is built out. Um, that state file can be stored locally. That's what I'll be doing today or remotely, depending on your deployment type and need. So as I said, local state for learning, testing, labs, development, that's a fairly common way of working. That's what I'll be using today. If you are using remote state, chances are you're probably working with perhaps DevOps tooling or you're collaborating on code and think, think of a process where multiple people are writing code and then that's um, that's being run in a pipeline, for example. So I just want to talk now about some ways of working. So this um, example is very much how my demo will be running today. We have all work done on a single machine, local, that's the orange box. I'm going to create some code and I'm going to modify that code and show you how that works. That code saved into a local folder. Terraform runs locally on my machine and then infrastructure is created, updated or destroyed. That's great for learning. That's great for development. That's great for getting started, doing testing, perhaps a a lab environment, for example. But one of the challenges of that is that it doesn't really work in an enterprise scenario. You know, supposing I'm working with a colleague on code and we need to collaborate. Well, local folders, one person running it, it's not really set up to uh, to work, you know, well in in that sort of environment. We need to make some changes to how we're going to operate. So. A more remote example would be perhaps two people working on code together and then saving that code in a, a GitHub repo, Azure DevOps or another piece of tooling, and actually then saving that code, you know, writing commits, keeping it in a centralized location. Um, Terraform would actually then be run in a pipeline of some form. So it could be an Azure DevOps pipeline, could be GitHub Actions, for example. Um, and we probably then store the state file in a remote storage area. So perhaps Azure storage as an example. Now. The great aspect to this is that both of the people in this scenario can actually change the code, they can modify the code and then trigger or perhaps have automated pipeline runs. But if something were to happen to one of these people, so perhaps this person's gone on leave or had to go off sick or something like that, the other person isn't left, you know, trying to get the code from their device or, um, you know, left not being able to make those those runs and, and update the infrastructure. Taking that a step further as well, perhaps you work in a, a globally distributed team where you have people all around the world working on code, committing it to a repo, running the code, storing the state file remotely. Well, any one of these people potentially could make changes to that code and trigger that process. And it just allows you to build out a, a working practice that, that doesn't have a single point of failure on a single person um, or a dependency on a single individual, for example. So those those three stages working from local through to perhaps two people in the same uh, country or team or perhaps the same office working together, all the way through to a distributed team working on infrastructure, are very common scenarios in, in Terraform. So let's just 
sort of think back about why why we would actually use Terraform for Azure deployment. And I've listed here, you know, this is just a few key reasons. I say a few, there's sort of seven or eight here. But um, for me, these are kind of the, the key ones that I think are really important and really help um, sort of emphasize just how valuable Terraform could be. So it allows us to create infrastructure repeatedly in different locations, regions, and platforms. The, the demo environment I'm going to show today, for example, I could wake up one morning and go, Do you know, what? I'm going to deploy that in the UK South region. And then I'm going to test it and then I'm going to destroy it and I'm going to go and deploy it in East US. And that could all be done um, in a matter of minutes. So that that sort of ease of building out in different regions, uh, different platforms, different locations, whatever it may be, is, is a huge benefit. Um, rapid deployment and testing. So one of the things I often do in my in my role as a solution architect is, is demonstrate environments and concepts to customers. Well, keeping a large environment running could be quite costly. So I actually have uh, my own lab environment running in Terraform Cloud that I create and destroy as I require. So it takes about 40 minutes for me to deploy that environment. I can do that from a mobile device. I can do that from my laptop. I just need to trigger the deployment. I can use that environment to do my demo, do a talk about whatever it may be and destroy it when I'm finished. Very effective from a cost perspective. Again, I've just talked about cost, but it is it is very cost effective for test environment. So create on demand, destroy ones to use, and that can extend to your testing for production, your testing of a potential rollout of a new application or an upgrade. Um, Terraform also uh, makes it very easy to scale up, down, in or out as required. So there's lots of functions and conventions, things like being able to use count so we can define a number of resources to be created. Things like using map variables so we can define the same block of infrastructure to be built in multiple locations, for example. Um, and again, count things like count and variable methods like maps do mean that expansion or contraction can be done very easily um, a really important point as well is version control of infrastructure so have a think about you know at the moment if you have a an environment that's very manual that really doesn't have version control on it unless you, you know, you've plugged some other tooling into it but actually having your infrastructure defined in code that has versions and history well that is version controlling that infrastructure for you um, it also allows you to work safely and in a standardized way across distributed teams. So let's take a, a just a made up scenario, but let's say you've got a team of people that work on a global infrastructure who are all around the world and they need to work safely together to control that and manage that infrastructure. Well, using tooling like Terraform, the code could be written in Terraform, saved in a remote repo, think GitHub or Azure DevOps or similar. And then that pipeline could be run at a pre-agreed time or manually by one member of the team at a pre-agreed time. What that means is we actually have a method of a, controlling the changes to that infrastructure. Those changes can be compared, we can run plans, we can roll it back if needs be. And then we have a standardized way of actually making those changes and deployments to our, to our infrastructure estate. What's really great about Terraform as well is if let's say we have a production deployment, well, we could duplicate that and have another repo for test, for example. Um, and that leads me nicely to the last point that we can write once and deploy many times. You know, if you're a service provider or perhaps you, you have an application you deploy that you've, you've created for multiple customers, having that standardized approach, that standardized deployment, again, write once, deploy many times, far more cost effective and far more standardized than, than, than doing it manually. So let's talk about installing Terraform. So I've just grabbed a screenshot from the HashiCorp um, Learn page here just to show that. But actually, the recommended in installation here um, and the one I would I would personally use is just to use Chocolaty to install it. Very straightforward. Choco install Terraform. Um, you can see I've just provided three additional, um, sorry, three commands, two additional ones. Um, I would also recommend that you have the Azure CLI, and we'll need that for the demo I'm going to do today. I'd also recommend VS Code as well. Use that as your your environment for editing and, and modifying the code. The reason I would recommend VS Code is because there's a really great plugin available from, from HashiCorp. So syntax highlighting and auto completion for Terraform gives you things like IntelliSense, again, syntax validation and highlighting, code navigation, formatting, snippets, and integration to Terraform Cloud should you require it. So that's kind of the minimum I would recommend you have installed. Um, it will make life very easy, makes things very straightforward, and is really useful. I think IntelliSense, when you're trying to learn and build out new resources, it will really just help with the sort of auto completion and that sort of stuff. 
Um, also, a, a helping hand if you are learning, I'd, I'd recommend try GitHub Copilot. So you can see here, I've just um, asked it to do something fairly, fairly straightforward in Terraform terms. I've asked it to write the Terraform to create two public IPs in the UK South region and do that using the count function. So I've thrown a curveball in there. I haven't just asked for two blocks of code. I've asked it to actually use a function. And what you'll see here on the right is it's actually gone off and done that for me. So it's added the Azure RM provider. That's this section here. And what it's then done is created me public IP, so an Azure RM public IP, but you'll see it's used count and defined two of those. It's used count index as part of the name, and it's built out the rest of the elements we'd need. So you'll see here there's a resource group, and that's just been created down here for us as well. So this is really useful because by taking Copilot, and giving it perhaps a, a simple prompt, something you'd like it to do, and then examining the code it's created, perhaps you can then try modifying that code or just working with it to, to understand it a little bit more. But I'd absolutely recommend checking that out as a, as a way to sort of help you get started and, and learn a little bit more. So now actually going to move into the, the demonstration part of, uh, of the session. So um, just want to call out everything I'm using today is actually available in my Terraform Azure repo. Um, it's github.com slash jakewalsh90 slash terraform dash azure just go to jakewalsh.co.uk there's a link to my github in there and you'll be able to find the, the terraform repo um, all you need is terraform installed um, you can do that using the chocolatey command that I, I showed previously vs code and the azure cli those are the kind of three essential things you need installed and also you will need an azure subscription to deploy into so we're actually going to run through a few things. We're going to deploy a simple lab environment. That's a, like a lab um, demo file that I've got that's again, is available in that, that repo I've shared. Um, we're going to just run through the code files, take a look at what they are, what they contain, um, and what's actually being deployed by those. Then we're going to look at changes. So what happens if we make a change? And then finally, we'll look at destruction um, and how Terraform actually manages that process for us. OK, so we're now going to move on to the demo uh, section of my festive tech calendar session today. So I'm actually starting with um, an environment that's called the Single Region Azure Base Lab V2. This is something I created just for labs, demos, testing, that sort of stuff. And it's a simple Terraform based Azure lab environment. So as you can see, I'm in Visual Studio Code. Um, we've got a number of files here on the left, um, core, optional, provider. There's a readme. Um, you can also see a state file. Um, and TF files and variables. So I'm just going to go through these quickly, break them down, explain what, uh, what they all are. So we'll start with a provider file. As you can see here, I'm actually defining two providers in this section. So one is the Azure RM provider, um, it shows the source and the version, and the other is the random provider. And I'm using that, again, I'll show this a little bit later, to generate some randomization for passwords um, in, the, uh, in the lab environment. So we also then have a number of other files, and I want to focus just on the TF files and the variables.tf to start with. So variables.tf defines all of the variables that are listed in our environment. So you can see here we've got things like an environment tag, we've got region one, we've got a naming code for that region, we've got a, um, a network range, a CIDR range for region one, we've got a count for the number of virtual machines, and so on and so forth. There's a number of um, variables defined in here. Now, our terraform.tfvars file essentially answers that variables file. And if we were to run this deployment without that tfvars file, we'd be prompted to actually enter those variables each time. So in this case, you can see I've answered the, um, the actual core variables um, for this environment. Um, you'll notice as well, it was in variables.tf, but some of the um, variables are actually optional features. So this particular lab has things that can be turned on or off with a true false flag in the variables file. So today I've got all of those set to false. I'm just keeping it nice and simple with fairly basic um, lab environment here. So what I'm actually going to do now is just move into the actual code. So we'll look at the core.tf. These are the, the baseline elements, the essential things that are deployed in, in every lab environment here. So you'll see there's resource groups. You can see the blocks of code. We have one here for identity, one here for connectivity, and another here for security. These are essentially just the same code block duplicated, but you can see the identity has been changed to connectivity and security, and we've got different tagging applied and so on and so forth. So you can see how easy it is to start building up these things in Terraform. Once you're familiar with one resource, it's easy to duplicate that block and create another. Um, I'm then creating a key vault. So I'm actually here, I'm actually starting by um, just building out a random ID. So the key vault name will be randomized. As you know, they have to be unique in Azure. Um, I'm also then building out the key vault object, an access policy for it. And then I'm actually using that random feature here to create a password for my virtual machine. So I'm creating the password first, I'm then storing it in my key vault. So that password is saved in the key vault. And again, every time I run this deployment, that's a completely different, um, different password. So 10 different people could run this deployment and they would get 10 different passwords. 
and then building out some virtual networks. You can see here, I've actually got a hub virtual network. I'm actually also then building out a spoke. And I'm actually using a function here. Now, this is probably something I wouldn't recommend starting with, but it's something I've used just to keep the code simple in this lab environment. But I'm actually using the CIDR subnet function, which is one of the functions within Terraform that allows you to do subnet calculations. So again, you know, this is just one of the features in Terraform that can be very handy for building out those environments. Um, we have a number of subnets here, quite a few as you can see. So gateway subnet here, a firewall subnet here, a bastion subnet, and then a number of subnets um, for just general use. Again, these are actually being built out using the count function. So it's creating multiple of them um, based on the, the count number defined there. Um, I've then got a block for VNet peering, so it's making sure those are connected correctly. And then actually using um, an IP uh, checker website to grab that data. So what's my current IP? And I'm actually then building an NSG that only allows my IP address to RDP into that virtual machine. So again, security built in right from the outset. I know open RDP is a, a bit of a no-no um, in terms of, you know, you don't want to use it. It's not perhaps the most secure, but in terms of just building out a simple lab environment, then um, obviously it gives us something we can use, something we can use here and we know it's secure from the outset. Um, again, another network security group here. I'm also associating those NSGs. Again, number of networks associated here, hub associated, sorry. I'm just using a depends on to make sure that those are built before the association takes place. Um, I'm also using uh, the random provider here to create a random uh, label to use within DNS, which is then used in the public IPs below. Um, I've then got some network cards here. You can see I'm building out those network cards for the virtual machines. Um, I'm then building out disks for the virtual machines. So that's this section here. We then have an availability set um, here. So those any more than uh, one VM and that'll be placed in an availability set. And then we have a virtual machine block here. So you can see it's actually building out VMs based on a variable that has the count, um, apply, count um, function applied to it as well. So I'm then attaching those data disks and last but by no means least, I'm running a setup script on those virtual machines, which just runs a number of um, elements to make sure that VM is provisioned and, and ready for me. So before we dive into running that deployment, I just want to also demonstrate the power of Copilot. I'm just going to create a file called copilot.tf. Copilot.tf. And I'm going to ask GitHub Copilot to do something here. So create two public IP addresses using Terraform in UK South in Azure with the count function. Let's just see what comes back from that. You can see here it's already started building this out for us. We have um, the Azure RM provider has been added. I'll just accept that so we can view it. Azure RM provider has been added. We have public IP addresses. There is a count of two. The location is UK South. It also knows that we need a resource group as part of that, and it's actually built that resource group out below for us. So you can see we have to be quite um, direct in terms of the command. I want it to use Terraform. I want it to do it in Azure, the region I want, the number I want. But this is just a great example. If you don't know how to do something in Terraform, then use GitHub Copilot to assist. Right, I'm just going to close that uh, down now. We don't need that. So what we're actually going to do now is move to the um, element of the demo where I actually start showing the deployment, showing you how it would how it would operate. So what we're going to do is deploy the, the core environment here. We've obviously got our variables already set. So in TFRs, we're not deploying any of the optional features. We're just deploying the core elements of this lab here. So what we'll do, we'll need to start just down in the terminal, and we're going to do an AZ login. So let's log in. I'll now be prompted to authenticate. That will come up. Um, obviously prompt in a browser. We're now logged in successfully to Azure, so we can close that down. What I'm just going to do is I'm going to set the subscription to my default one. So this is a subscription I want to be deploying into today, and I'm just going to run a Terraform initialize. Now I'm also going to use the upgrade flag because I've already deployed this environment once this morning to test it, so I'm just going to run upgrade, so otherwise it will prompt to say that the initialization has already been done. So you can see it's gone off, it's found the providers, it's initialized Terraform successfully, and we're actually ready to run this deployment. So let's actually start with a Terraform plan. What this is going to do is just, uh, it's going off, it's actually gathering the data items first, and then it'll uh, come back and give me an execution plan for the code that it plans on, uh, the, sorry, the infrastructure that it plans on deploying today. So I'll just move this up here a little bit. OK, so you can see we actually have 36 resources to add according to the plan just down here. 36. We just scroll up to have a quick look at this. 
OK, so you can see it's actually going to perform a number of actions here. It's going to build an availability set. That's this block here. It's going to build a key vault here with all of the relevant access and object permissions. It's building out a password in the key vault. It's creating a managed data disk. It's also creating a network interface here. We've got a security group here, another security group. We have a public IP. We have a resource group, multiple resource groups uh, even. We have a subnet for Bastion, firewall, um, gateway, you know, lots of different subnets here being created. Um, we then have, let's scroll through these subnets, a number of NSG associations, um, a virtual machine extension, so it's running this PowerShell script, a uh, virtual network. And you'll notice, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these because we'll be here uh, for hours, but essentially it's just listing out all of the resources that uh, are going to be created. So if we want to actually apply that, what we need to do is just run Terraform apply. OK, so now the um, apply process and you'll notice it's actually rerun plan again for us. So whenever you run apply, it will rerun plan and it will actually just run through a check. So you've got the latest plan at the point when you're asked whether you want to run apply or not. So it's now saying it's got 36 resources to add, none to change and none to destroy. So I'm just going to say yes. Um, anything other than yes at this point will result in that not being run. So let's just trigger that. What we'll see now is Terraform actually running through and creating all of these resources. So um, I will probably appear to move very rapidly at this point because I will just pause and break the video um, whilst Terraform just does that. Just, it'll take about five to ten minutes to do this. So um, obviously no one wants to sit and watch me for five to ten minutes. So <laughs> just, uh, we'll come back in a second once this is, uh, is completed. OK, so as you can see, the apply process is finished now. So we have an environment that's been applied by Terraform and our infrastructure has been built. Um, took around 10 minutes. Obviously, I've, I've shortened the video just to um, so we're not just sat waiting for 10 minutes. Um, you can actually see that about seven minutes of that, though, was uh, the extension I created. So that's running my PowerShell script on the virtual machine. So um, yeah, still a very efficient process from a perspective of building out an environment. What I'll do now is I'll just bring the Azure portal across. So what I've actually done here is just uh, pulled up the resources that have been built by Terraform in this case. So they're all part of my Baselab v2 environment. And you'll see we've got an availability set, we've got a disk, we've got a key vault, we've got a network card, two network security groups, a public IP, a virtual machine, a disk for that virtual machine. And we've also got um, a hub and a spoke network as well. So built out quite a lot really for uh, for us in that short space of time. And just to, just to demonstrate some of the capabilities, you'll see this spoke virtual network I've created here. Actually, if I go to subnets, you'll see it has a number of subnets. Again, these have been provisioned by, by Terraform as well. If we go to the public IP that's been created, you'll see it actually has a, a DNS name. That was again created by Terraform as well. One of the things I'm quite keen to show in this environment is obviously this virtual machine has been provisioned for me, it's been provisioned um, by Terraform. And if I just pop back to the code for a second, what I'll do is I'll show you in our tfvars file that actually the only thing I've defined here is the admin username for that virtual machine. If we just come down into the to the core file here, um, I'll just demonstrate that to you. So you can see the actual admin username is that variable, but the actual password is the VM password that was automatically generated as a random um, as a random string by Terraform and saved in the key vault. So when we actually go back to the um, Azure environment here, just showing that in the portal, for me to log on to this virtual machine, I'd actually go and have to pull that um, key vault value, that secret, before I could log on. So if we go to VM password here to the version, what I'll do is I'll copy that to the clipboard. Um, we'll just go to this virtual machine and I'm just going to connect using RDP. Just select that and download the file. So just enter my credentials. Obviously, if we go back to the TFRs, we know that the username is lab admin and I've just copied that um, key vault secret to the clipboard. So I'll paste that in and we'll log on to that virtual machine now. So this has all been provisioned by Terraform for me. Um, I have a virtual machine. I don't even know what the password is. I've literally just copied it off the um, clipboard from the key vault. So very secure from the outset. And this is just another really good example of how you can build that security in uh, right from the outset using Terraform. 
once we connect to this virtual machine, we'll just see a, a fairly standard Windows server. We should have a couple of things installed on it that was done so by the custom script extension that I that I set up. Just pull back to the code for a second. So if we go back to here, just scroll down. Yeah, you'll see it. it's actually running this this PowerShell script. So I'll just control click that to follow it. You can see I'm actually just enabling a number of features. I'm also using Chocolatey to install a number of things on that virtual machine. So if we just pop back here, you can see, yeah, we've got applications installed. I'll go to the start menu. There'll be a few other bits and bobs um, installed on this VM uh, for us. Yeah, you can see we've got Chrome here. We've got Notepad++. Win SCP, a few other bits and bobs. So that that script has run, and this virtual machine is is ready to be used. So I'll just close that down for now. Now that's really the end of the demonstration. Um, I'm just going to make a few changes and tweaks, and then we'll run the destroy phase. But one thing I just want to cover off whilst we're um, looking at this environment is just some of the resources that are available to help you. So as I mentioned, the Terraform Azure repo within my GitHub. Um, just go back to that now, has a number of different environments that you can deploy. This is uh, the single region base lab V2. That's also supported by an overview blog post I've written here available on my, my site. It walks you through the environment. It talks about the features, capabilities. It has a diagram, shows how to download it, and also has some links and features to get started. Um, worth noting, if you do want to perhaps look at getting started in more detail, I actually have a series, um, a simple Azure Terraform walkthrough on my blog that will take you through the whole process from, from start to finish. So what we'll do now is we'll actually make a change to the environment. So I'm actually going to go back to our TF files file, and I'm just going to make a number of changes. So let's actually change the count of the virtual machines to two, and let's assume a security uh, team or somebody has come back and said, well, we don't want the name admin in your admin user account or something like that. So let's just put uh, lab, um, lab controller for, for the purposes of this. So we'll save that file. What we'll actually do now is run a Terraform plan. And what we'll see here is plan will go away, look at our infrastructure and work out the differences between the two and what needs to happen to, to actually action these changes. Okay, so that plan is now uh, completed and you'll actually see that there's uh, nine um, to add, one to change and three to destroy. So because we made a few changes here, we've asked the VM count to be increased to two and we've asked for the admin username of the VM to be changed. Actually, what that's going to mean is that the virtual machine will need to be rebuilt and um, obviously to, to apply that new username and that obviously the number of VMs is going to increase to two. So that's the reason for the increase. That's the reason for the change and that's the reason for the destroy. A number of resources with virtual machines do have to be destroyed each time that the VM is um, is changed in a, in a specific way. So um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm not going to run the apply now just in the interest of time, but I'm going to move on to the destroy phase. But if we were to rerun apply now, it would ask us to confirm and then these changes will be actioned in our code. So hopefully that just gives you a view on how straightforward and simple it is to make infrastructure changes using using Terraform. So last but by no means least, and probably the most important from a, a FinOps perspective, and you know certainly if you're working perhaps in an MSDN subscription or, or in a lab environment where, where costs are quite tightly controlled, is the destroy phase. So assuming I've built this lab, I've done the testing that I need to do, and I'm now ready to destroy it, that's a very straightforward process as well. So we'd actually just run Terraform destroy. Let's see if I can uh, spell destroy today. There we go. And we'll just uh, enter that. Now, what will actually happen is Terraform will go off and again, it will run that plan, but it will run that plan assuming that we want to destroy the infrastructure. So at the end of this plan phase, it will actually spit out a number of resources and say, hey, look, this is the number that I need to destroy. OK, so you can see that plan um, has finished and we now actually have an output here. It says 36 resources to destroy. It's actually asking us to confirm that as well. So if we um, select anything other than yes at this point, no, no destruction will happen. But I'm going to say yes because I want all of this removed. I've, I've finished my testing, so we'll say yes to that now. So what's actually going to happen now is Terraform is going to go through all of the items it created and essentially run a destroy. So it's going to do the reverse of the apply. So as you can see, the destroy process is now completed. We have 36 resources that have been destroyed. Um, you'll see it's just been uh, running through those in the terminal here. I'll just switch back to the Azure portal here. Let me just bring that across. Just do a refresh. And you'll see there's no resources left. Um, from what I've what I've created. So that um, that concludes the demonstration. I hope it's been been useful and just given you an insight into how easy Terraform is to use with Azure, how quick it is to create and destroy those resources and allow us to make changes. Certainly from a, you know, this is just a local perspective uh, where we're building a lab, but hopefully this just gives you that insight and introduction um, that you need.
So I hope the demo was useful. I hope that uh, gave you a good insight to, um, to Terraform and all of the various things and a bit of a starting point to think about your sort of Terraform Azure journey. Um, in terms of next steps, um, this video will go out on the Festive Tech Calendar website and YouTube channel, but also um, I'll have a blog post up. So do have a look at my website because I'll link to um, any of the resources I've included here, obviously help you provide those to get started but i just recommend um two things on my blog one is the category of terraform so jake walsh to code uk slash category slash terraform and the other one jake walsh to code uk slash category slash azure that will contain all of my articles about azure and terraform um i'd also recommend checking out the hashicorp learn page so there's a really good azure tutorial on there that will guide you through the process and give you lots of starting points um, and then finally try some sample environments so again within my github repo there's a number of environments in there you can deploy for various different um, things that you could want in Azure, but it's a good place to get started using those familiar environments will, will give you something you can deploy and then tweak as a, as a starting point. And finally, just to thank you. Thank you for uh, making it to the end of the, the session and staying with me. Um, thanks to all the organisers of the festive tech calendar and uh, hope to see you again soon. Cheers.